It was a fun night at Oriole Park on Wednesday. Dean Kramer just kept throwing his best pitch. Kobe Mayo got his first hit. Gunnar Henderson got home run number 30. And the Orioles beat their little brothers from down in D.C. I'll recap the win over the Nats coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles. Your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Thursday, August 15th, 2024, and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on this episode, we are going to chat about the Orioles' win over the Washington Nationals, taking down the Nats 4-1 to on Wednesday night. I'll get you the five things you need to know from that one, including a big night for Mayo, a big night for Henderson, and for Dean Kramer as well. Pretty complete win for the Orioles. Then we'll chat a little bit about, with Grayson Rodriguez out, it's kind of Burns and Eflin at the top of the rotation, who is the Orioles' number three starter right now, and then who would be the number four in the playoffs when Grayson comes back? And finally, we'll talk a bit about the Orioles' upcoming schedule now. One more kind of tough stretch before things do get a little bit easier in September. But that's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast, which is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. So let's start with an Orioles win. Final score from Oriole Park at Camden Yards on Wednesday night is the O's 4 and the Washington Nationals 1 in Game 2 of the quick two-game set after the Nats kind of beat up on the O's on Tuesday night. The teams split the two-game set, and then uh, over the season, they split 2-2 two and two in the four games that they will generally play every year. And I'm going to get you the five things you need to know from the Orioles win over the Nats on Wednesday night. The first thing you need to know is Kobe Mayo got his first major league hit. And listen, it took a little while for Kobe Mayo. I mean, no one's denying that. It was kind of a rough start to his big league career. He looked semi-uncomfortable at the plate for a while, wasn't really putting things together too, too well. But despite a... uh 0 for 15, or I guess after he lined out in his first at-bat Wednesday, it was an 0 for 16 to begin his big league career. He got it done. Now, it wasn't, you know, a Kobe Mayo absolute bomb to left field. It wasn't a, you know, 105 mile per hour ball off the bat. But you know what he did? He singled a lead off the fifth inning. He got a pitch up and in. He turned on it, hit it only like 80 miles per hour off the bat, but he lobbed it into left field for a leadoff single. And it was, you know, Kind of cool that, hey, he just waited until he made his Camden Yards debut, got the start at third base against the lefty on the mound, DJ Hers for the Nats, and got it done. And listen, he just looked much better at the plate overall. He had a pretty good looking swing in the second inning when he lined out to left field, hit a ball pretty hard. He had a seven-pitch walk amidst the Orioles' two-run rally in the seventh. That was actually a really, really important walk. He took a 3-2 changeup just off the outside corner. I was pretty impressed by that uh, plate appearance by Mayo in the seventh. Honestly, even more than I was impressed by the hit. That really looked good for him to get on base and keep that rally going. He made a nice play defensively in the first inning. His throw was kind of off. Mountcastle saved him with a nice catch, but he made a nice pick down at third base. And hey, you know what? He needed that hit. It was cool to do it in his home debut. And we'll kind of see what this means. I thought there was a chance the Orioles would option Mayo back to AAA and, and call up somebody like J.D. Davis before Tuesday's game, but they stuck with him. They start him against the lefty. The Red Sox are throwing a righty tonight in Nick Pavetta, so theoretically you might see Arias back out there at third base, but it will be interesting to see kind of how this plays out uh, for the rest of this week and how long Mayo can stick around on this Orioles roster, but he did enough to get his big moment on Wednesday night. Second thing you need to know from that one is that Gunnar Henderson finally reached 30 home runs. He was at 28 homers entering the All-Star break. And you're like, this guy's on track for 40, trying to get to 50. It's been a fantastic year. And then he went on a bit of a home run drought. He did not homer from the All-Star break until August 4th, and then did not homer again until the 14th on Wednesday night, 10 days later. Just two home runs since the break, but finally gets to 30. Now, he's still been hitting. He's got a 306 average and an 848 OPS in the month of August. So even without the long ball, which really propelled him in the first half, he's still playing now better defense and is still picking up hits. He's got 
I believe it's now four three-hit games in the month of August. But it's nice to see him hit homers as well. He does it off a lefty in DJ Hers, just gets a first pitch fastball in the first inning and rockets it out to right field for a two-run shot. 113.1 miles per hour off the bat for Henderson off an inside fastball against the lefty. It traveled 419 feet for that 30th home run of the year. That thing was a laser shot off the bat, and it actually ties for the hardest hit ball of the season from Henderson. He also had a double off Ryan Burr of the Blue Jays back on June 3rd that was also 113.1 off the bat, but this one was his hardest hit ball. Not his furthest hit home run. He's actually got five more that have been hit further, uh, but that thing was rocketed off the bat of Henderson and truly nice to see as he's just been under a little bit of a home run drought. Third thing you need to know from this Orioles win on Wednesday is that the O's offense added on even after getting the two in the first on the Henderson home run. And this is something Brandon Hyde has been talking about lately, how it's been a little frustrating that when the Orioles offense does get out to leads and maybe they have a big inning early, they haven't been able to add on. And we know some of the struggles they've had with the bullpen. It just allows other teams to hang around, even if the Orioles ultimately win games. But even though it wasn't a huge offensive day, right? They scored only four runs on seven hits. It was nice to see them draw five walks in the game, but they didn't exactly have an explosion. But those two runs in the seventh were huge. I mean, the O's got two in the first, the Nats got one in the second, and it was a two-to-one game from the second all the way until the seventh. The O's pitching was just holding on. The offense wasn't giving them much, but then they rallied. Two runs in the seventh inning after a, a leadoff ground out in the inning. Kobe Mayo and Colton Kowser both walked to get a couple on base. They brought in the lefty to face Jackson Holiday, and Holiday had a huge moment. Not only did he pick up an RBI single off a lefty to make it a 3-1 game, he did it against a high fastball. And that was the pitch that was giving him the most trouble when he struggled in his first stint in the big leagues. But a 95-mile-per-hour fastball at the top of the zone, he ripped it into center field, 104 off the bat for a base hit. That was a fantastic sign right there for Jackson Holiday to extend the lead. And then, hey, Ryan O'Hearn came in as a pinch hitter, delivered a big single. Does, does Brandon Hyde get credit for a pinch hit single to keep a rally going. And Adley Rutschman, although he didn't break it open when he had a chance to, the sack fly was important there with the bases loaded to at least extend that lead to four to one. And adding on is just going to make things easier for your bullpen, especially as you're still trying to figure out what exactly the back end of these games look like. But speaking of the bullpen, they were pretty good too. The fourth thing you need to know is the Oriole bullpen just did not flinch. They certainly loved that the O's got them a, a little extra in the bottom of the seventh inning, but they had to come in in the seventh and they just went Cano, Perez, Dominguez, good morning, good afternoon, and good night to the Nationals offense. Only base runner in there was a Sir Anthony Dominguez leadoff walk in the ninth inning, but then he got a strikeout and a double play to lock down the save. Yenier Cano went one, two, three on 10 pitches in the seventh. CNL Perez went one, two, three with a strikeout also on 10 pitches in the eighth inning. It was just really impressive what we saw from that Oriole bullpen. There's been a few struggles from some of these guys in the last couple of outings, but they just attacked the strike zone. Cano, Perez, and then Dominguez after the walk just went after the zone, and it worked because they all have fantastic stuff, and if they just attack the strike zone, good things are going to happen. That is what we saw on Wednesday night. Now, I'm not sure even with Dominguez, picking up his second save with the Orioles. I'm not sure this makes him the de facto closer right now as Craig Kimbrell continues to go through some struggles. I think it's still a closer by committee. And, you know, Yinyar Cano has gotten a save chance recently. Now, Cano got the seventh because when you're doing closer by committee, this is how you manage the game late. If you have a one-run lead, you're trying to get your best relievers in there when the lead is one run and then hoping, okay, give my offense another chance to add on. So if you think Cano is your best matchup reliever against the Nats, it's the perfect time to throw him in the seventh because you say, okay, I trust Cano to keep it at two to one. And then maybe when my offense extends it, I can go to reliever number two and three in the eighth and ninth innings. And that's exactly how it worked out again. Another plus for Brandon Hyde is going to get credit for that. Cano gets the zero, the O's get two in the bottom of the seventh, and then it's easier for Perez and Dominguez who get the job done as well in the eighth and ninth. And the fifth and final thing you need to know from the Orioles 4-1 to win over the Nationals on Wednesday night to split the series is that Dean Kramer was really, really solid 
in this game. Took the baseball for the O's. He'd had kind of an up and down last couple of starts where he hadn't been good at times. Then at times his line wasn't good, but his defense had completely let him down. This one looked good. Six innings of one run ball, five hits, three strikeouts, and two walks for Kramer on 92 pitches, seven hard hit balls by the Nats offense against him. And listen, you know, three strikeouts in six innings is not like he was just dominating the hitters, but what he was was efficient through those six innings. And here was the best part. Dean Kramer used to throw a changeup, kind of turned it into a splitter this season. And while it's been his third most used pitch, when he's thrown it, at least close to the strike zone, it's been effective. Opponents were hitting just 132 against his splitter coming into Wednesday's start. And the Orioles, although Kramer had been pitching better as of late, made kind of a drastic change with Kramer. Now, I'm not sure how much that was Drew French or Ryan Klimek or Mitch Plassmeyer, or was it, you know, Kramer working with Adley? Like, you're not quite sure. It was probably some of all of that. But he was splitter happy on Wednesday night. 31 splitters in 92 pitches was by far his most used pitch. His next most used pitch was the sinker, which he only threw 19 times. So splitter at 31 was pretty impressive. Now, he only had three swings and misses on 19 swings against that pitch, but it was a 55% zone rate. We've seen stuff closer to like 25% on the end zone rate for the splitter in the past from Kramer. That is good. That means he's commanding it a little better and is able to throw it for a called strike at times, not just getting a chase out of the zone. That's really important to make kind of hitters respect that pitch more because you know he can throw it for a strike. That was the best that it looked. Even when it didn't get swings and misses, it got soft ground balls. It got him outs, which is huge. There were nine balls in play against that splitter. The average exit velocity was 81 miles an hour against the pitch. That was fun to watch. And I don't think it's necessarily what it was like for Kyle Bradish a couple of years ago. If you remember, I just kept yelling at Kyle Bradish, like, your slider is your best pitch. Throw it more. And finally, his slider became his number one pitch, and he finished fourth in AL Cy Young voting last year. It's really hard, as, especially as a starter, to have a splitter be your number one pitch consistently. But every now and then, you can have a game like this where you go to that splitter, and it works out really well. And that's what we saw for the Orioles on Wednesday night. As Kramer pitches well. And hey, you know, he could have even put up zeros. I mean, it was a tough play in the second inning, but that ball did hit Anthony Santander's glove on the Alex Call RBI double. It could have been six scoreless for Dean Kramer. He really did pitch well. And that's the thing. Like with Grayson Rodriguez out, the Orioles kind of have two starters they're trusting right now in Corbin Burns and Zach Eflin. Who's going to be that number three guy? And even if Grayson does come back this year, you might need a fourth starter in the postseason. Who would that be? Dean Kramer's in the mix. Albert Suarez is in the mix. Trevor Rogers in the mix. Even Cade Povich is still in that mix. What did Kramer do to move himself up that order? We'll talk about that coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which getting or makes getting tickets faster and easier. Prices on the Game Time app, they actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. With killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guarantee, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. Now, I haven't been to a game in a little while, but now I am scouring the Game Time app because maybe, listen, there's a four game series against the Red Sox starting this weekend. There's a couple of giveaways. I want to be at the yard for that. So I'm looking at the Game Time app. I'm looking for flash deals. I'm looking for zone deals. I'm looking for those last minute deals where you can save up to 60% off buying last minute Orioles tickets. So take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On MLB. That is L O C K E D O N M L B for twenty dollars off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So a big part of the Orioles win over the Nats on Wednesday night was the work of Dean Kramer, six innings of one run ball. And there is kind of an open competition right now. Grayson Rodriguez is on the injured list with that mild lat strain. The O's hope he's going to be back at some point mid to late September. I mean, you hope you can get him for a couple of starts in the regular season, and then you, know, you make the postseason, and you hope Grayson can come back and, and be your number two guy behind Burns in the playoffs. And you look at the playoff rotation if Grayson's healthy of 
Corbin Burns, Grayson Rodriguez, and Zach Eflin, the way those guys are pitching, that looks pretty good. But number one, you don't have Grayson right now. So you kind of have two starters you're really trusting. And it, it's tough to get through, you know, August and September like that. And even when Grayson comes back, you can sometimes get through, especially with this year's schedule, an ALDS with just three starters. But depending on how deep the regular season goes, like if you're playing until the last day for the division, if you end up in the wild card series, it's hard to reset your rotation. So you might need a fourth starter in the wild card series. Or if you get to the ALCS or the World Series, you might end up needing a fourth starter in the postseason. And that job, even if Grayson comes back fully healthy, you got Burns, Rodriguez, Eflin, that fourth spot is still very up for grabs. And really, there's four guys in the mix, three of them in the big leagues. It's Albert Suarez, it's Trevor Rogers. It's Dean Kramer, and then I'd still count Cade Povich in there, even though he's in AAA currently. He's made enough starts for the big league team this year. I think they would at least consider him, especially if they if they bring him up one more time, which they could before this season ends. But I wanted to take a look at kind of who is number three right now, and then who would be number four in the playoffs if you have to go there. And the Diamondbacks showed us last year, like, you can get to the World Series with two and a half starters. I mean, they rode, essentially, Zach Gallen and Merrill Kelly, and then... They would start Brandon Fott, but like they had training wheels on him when he went out there. That's why I called him basically a half starting pitcher when he would go. And they made it to the World Series like that. So you can do it, but you need amazing starts from the other guys. You need good off days, which always helps. And you need your offense to, to pick things up when the moment comes right. And that's a lot of luck involved. So we're looking at Suarez, 78 and two thirds innings, has a 3 4 3 ERA on the season, not a, a super high strikeout rate. He's walked a few guys on the year. Then you have Kate Povich, who in 37 innings did have a 6.27 ERA. You know, it, it was okay at times. It wasn't so great at others. Then you have what Trevor Rogers has done in three starts, 14 and a third innings with a 7.53 ERA. You don't love that. The FIP is much lower. And then you have Dean Kramer, who after a, a good start on Wednesday night of six innings and one run, he's at a 4.48 ERA on the season. Now, please let me know in the comments. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe to the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. Who would be your kind of number three right now slash number four in the postseason? Dean Kramer, I think, has the highest ceiling out of all these guys, at least from what we've seen. I think you could see a situation where between Povich, Suarez, Kramer, and Rogers, that Kramer, when he's locked in, I think can pitch the best out of those four. But it's also tough to get the image of what happened to Dean Kramer in the postseason last year out of your head. He got absolutely torched in the final game of the Orioles season in game three in Texas. Now, that's not to say that Grayson Rodriguez wasn't bad because he was really bad too. And I still say I would throw him right back out there and trust him in a postseason game as long as he is healthy. For Kramer, there's also the issue as when it's bad, it's really bad. He is susceptible to the home run ball. He gets hit hard. It can get out of hand when he does not have it. And that, to me, is kind of the same boat with Trevor Rogers. There's still another level that Rogers can get to. I just don't think from what we've seen in the Orioles, he can hopefully help them get to the postseason unless there's kind of another injury emergency. I don't see the Orioles starting Trevor Rogers in a playoff game, at least in 2024. Now, at Kate Povich, I just don't think he's going to get enough big league time again to be in that spot. So it feels like it really comes down to Kramer or Suarez. And I'm kind of flipping a coin between those two guys right now. Like we've seen Suarez be better throughout the season, but I still think Kramer's peaks are better than Albert Suarez's. And I do think either way, they will both be on the postseason roster. Just one of them will kind of be full-time in the bullpen. The other one will be kind of a half starter, half reliever. If the O's do make a deep postseason run, I think they'll both help the O's in some way in October. Now, right now, I think most people would say Suarez because he's coming off two fantastic starts since Grayson went on the injured list. But the body of work over the last couple of years and even over parts of this season is still better for Dean Kramer. And if this splitter is this new weapon, he's going to throw a lot more. He could become a different pitcher down the stretch. I mean, that would be huge if Kramer could go on a run here in August and September, especially until Rodriguez could get back. But if you told me that Rodriguez was going to be healthy tomorrow and the postseason was starting, I would have Burns number one, Rodriguez number two, Eflin number three. And if I needed a fourth postseason starter, I think right now I'd go with Albert Suarez because he's pitching so well. But my prediction would be, I think by the time we get to the postseason, I really like the splitter usage. I think Dean Kramer is going to find himself in that number four sp spot and maybe, just maybe, a chance at redemption in the playoffs. Now, it is a little bleak when these are your options. That's what the injuries have done to the Orioles starting rotation this year. But 
there is a part of Dean Kramer in there that can turn it on and go on a run. We've seen him do it plenty times before. Maybe the start against the Nats can kickstart him on Wednesday and he can help to kind of carry the load for the middle to back part of this Orioles rotation down the stretch. And down the stretch, the O's do have some, some tougher games coming up. The end of August is going to be brutal, but then things kind of flip to the easier side in September. I want to take just a quick look at the Orioles' schedule down the stretch. That will finish off the pod coming up next. But first, this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is the just most fun and exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. It's America's number one daily fantasy sports app, and it's got over 5 million users. How do you play? Well, all you do is pick more or less on two to six player stat projections and watch the winnings roll in. And you can now win up to 100 times your money with as little as four correct picks. And the hoops action is still ongoing this summer. The WNBA will get back into action. Stars like Caitlin Clark and Angel Reese. You're going to add them to your lineups. Brianna Stewart, Asia Wilson. You can watch them ball and, and just pick more or less on their stats up there. So download the Prize Picks app today and use code Locked On MLB for a first deposit match up to one hundred dollars. That's code Locked On MLB on Prize Picks for a deposit match up to one hundred dollars. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy. And today's episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast is also brought to you by Liquid IV. When you're taking in America's pastime, don't forget to hydrate with Liquid IV's Popsicle Firecracker flavor, a surefire summer hit. Get hydrated with electrolytes, essential vitamins, and clinically tested nutrients from the number one powdered hydration brand in America. Because baseball and summer, well, they go together like Liquid IV and indulgent hydration. And I'm a pretty hydrated guy. I drink a whole lot of water throughout the day, but Liquid IV can even expand that level of hydration. And it's so easy to just kind of fully hydrate yourself, whether it's a long flight, a hot day outside, you got to work out, you know, it's after a night out, whatever it may be, just tear, pour, live more, one stick plus 16 ounces of water hydrates better than water alone. And it's no more thirsty summers when you indulge in hydration with Liquid IV. Get 20% off your first order of Liquid IV when you go to liquidiv.com and use code MLB at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop better hydration today using promo code MLB at liquidiv.com. So to finish off today's episode, just want to take a look at the Orioles schedule down the stretch here because they had, I mean, you could call it like a an easier week, right? You got a Nationals team that, that's not going to the postseason. And then you had the Red Sox coming in for four games that starts tonight it's 6 35 start nick pavetta will go for the red sox they are 63 and 56 they did just win a series over the rangers although they lost the finale on wednesday in extra innings pavetta 95 innings good strikeout rate but he does have a 4.44 era on the season lasted only four and two thirds uh, in his last start out there against the rangers uh, about 10 days ago pavetta who has kind of missed a, a little bit of time lately but is back into the rotation on Thursday. And for the Red Sox, you know, they are fighting for a playoff spot right now. I believe looking at the, the wild card standings right now, Boston is the second team out. They are, oh no, they're the first team out. Excuse me. They are two games back of Kansas City of the final wild card spot. So they're fighting for it. They've had kind of an up and down season, but they're fighting for it. The Orioles have four games against them coming up this weekend at home. But then after that, Things do get fairly tough for the next three series. The O's go back on the road briefly to take on the Mets, and it's a Mets team that has lost now four of its, or believe me, seven of ten, I believe, the Mets coming in. Like, they haven't played great baseball lately. They are right in the thick of the fight in the NL wildcard. You got to go on the road, kind of a desperate team for three days next week. Then you welcome in the Houston Astros for a four-game series, a team that has played really good baseball lately and this Houston team is still sitting in first place in the AOS kind of fighting off the Mariners right now they've won eight games in a row at this point they're up two and a half games on Seattle they look like the Astros of old despite kind of a rough start to their season and that's a team that swept the Orioles in Houston earlier this year so that's going to be a tough four game set then an off day Monday the 26th followed by go on the west coast to take on the Dodgers who despite 
not getting a lot healthier. They did get Kershaw back. They did get Betts back, and they're playing better baseball. They're holding on to first place. you got a three-game series there to kind of mostly finish up August. That's not a fun stretch. At Mets versus Astros at Dodgers is not going to be fun for the Orioles. This is going to be a big stretch for them over the next 10 days or so. But here's the thing. After that happens, and you kind of get to right to the end of August and then beginning September, there's never an easy game. These are professional players. You got to take every game seriously, especially in September, to beat these teams you're supposed to beat. But the schedule certainly lightens down the stretch. After they go to LA, they go to Colorado to face a bad Rockies team for three games on the road from August 30th to September 1st. Then immediately they come back home and host the White Sox. I mean, that's a disaster of a team, but shout out to them. Even though they did blow a lead in the seventh to the Yankees. I mean, I'm I'm looking right now, it's 5-2 Yankees in the eighth Wednesday night. I'm assuming that's a Yankees win, so the Yanks will stay a half game above the Orioles in the AL East. But shout out to the White Sox for even winning one of the three games. I mean, that was huge against the Yankees for the Orioles this week. But you're hosting the White Sox, you know, Labor Day and then the next two days at home. Then an off day. Then you're hosting a Tampa Bay team who is just kind of in in rebuild mode for the rest of the season. Then you do go to Boston, and that's a Red Sox team that could be fully out of it by then. Fenway always a tough place to play. But then after that, three games in Detroit. You know, Tarek Skubal's great, but you hope you avoid him, and the Tigers are out of it. Then you're at home for three against the San Francisco Giants. They're basically a 500 team that's somehow in the wild card race, but they're not playing good baseball. And then three more at home against the Tigers again who are out of it. Most of September you are playing teams who are not in the playoff race right now. They do not play a team in the playoffs position right now in September until September 24th when they go to New York for a huge three-game series at Yankee Stadium and then they finish off the season with three in Minnesota against the Twins to cap off the regular season. So I say all that to say that this could be a tough stretch coming up, especially you know, including but, but even after this Boston series when, it's, when it goes Mets, Astros, and Dodgers. But after that, starting August 30th in Colorado against the Rockies, the O's have a stretch there of, what is it, 15, 18, 21 games, and none of those games are against teams that are currently in playoff position. That is where the Orioles can make their move. And the Yankees are kind of in a similar stretch right now. As I mentioned, they are playing the White Sox this week, but that is their time to make their move in the division. I'm not saying they have to, you know, open up a a five, six game lead and and clinch the division before they get to New York. But you got to put yourself in a spot in that stretch where you're going into that Yankee series, maybe just needing one win of the three games at Yankee Stadium to put yourself in a good position for the final weekend of the season. And you have a chance to do that with a lighter schedule. So hopefully the Orioles can survive, maybe play a little above 500 in this next tough stretch and then really let it rip when they have what, what is fairly helpful. Not only do they have four off days in September, but it's also a fairly easy schedule. That could be huge for this team, not just for winning the division or at the very least getting into the playoffs and securing that, but also maybe being a little more rested as they get into October as well, especially when you know, you're hoping Grayson Rodriguez, you're hoping Jacob Webb, you're hoping Jordan Westberg, you're hoping Danny Coulomb and these guys can come back and join you off the injured list. That could be big for the O's in the month of September. But first, They do got to play the games in front of them. That is the Boston Red Sox coming in tonight for game one of four. Pavetta versus Eflin. And I will be back tomorrow to recap game one of the four game set between the O's and the Red Sox. And also get you the latest edition of the Bullpen Trust Power Rankings of the O's Bullpen. Shuffling a little bit at the moment. I'll give you my thoughts on tomorrow's Friday episode to finish off the week. But again, that comes up tomorrow. Until then... I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.